Welcome to the FA Football Forum. This podcast episode was from a series delivered back in 2020 to help support grassroots clubs and leagues. This was delivered on a webinar platform and therefore may not make too much sense unless you've got the documentation to hand, all of which is available within the description below. With this being delivered during lockdown, sometimes the audio quality may differ. Please bear that in mind. But as always, if you've got any questions or you've got any inquiries in particular to this episode or any other episode, please reach out to us by emailing clubsprogram at thefa.com. Well, without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Russell. And Russell. I'm here is a sports VAT expert. So Russell, just to start with, do you want to just give a bit of background about your, your career to date and what you do? Yep, um, I'm a little bit worried that this echo is going to detract from the, from the presentation. Um, it's not too bad actually from this end. Okay, good. Okay, so I, I was formerly a VAT partner at a leading sports advisory accountancy firm um, for about 25 years and took early retirement four years ago, um, and since have been involved in advising sports governing bodies, and more importantly, um, community sports clubs on all matters to do with VAT. Um, perhaps most importantly, <coughs> advising on that recovery on capital projects, particularly where there are grant applications in with the Football Foundation, Football Stadium Improvement Fund, or Sport England or other um, funding bodies such as the FA. Um, and it covers the, the whole of England. I am based in Devon, um, but travel all around the country looking at different clubs. Um, I think I've just totting up early. I think I visited nearly 100 clubs last year uh, from Carlisle to Middlesbrough to Penzance over to Kent. Um, so I'm a, a good friend of the motorway, I'm afraid. Excellent. And Russell, Russell, I've got control of the, the slides, so when you want to, to move on, just say, move on, and I'll move the slides on for you, okay? Move on. How about that? Perfect. What a team. Okay, so there are um, four key things which I'd like to cover today. Um, at the end of the talk, I'm happy to take any questions at all which, which arise on these or any other VAT matters. But I think these issues cover the, the principal issues that clubs will be, need to be aware of uh, in order to correctly account for the VAT, correctly register for VAT, and hopefully correctly recover the optimum level of VAT which they can on costs. Uh, particularly in involved in facility improvement projects. Um, so the four areas I'd like to look at will be VAT registration. Um, it's a common misconception that you can only VAT register when your taxable turnover hits 85k per annum. We'll see that that's not the case, and there's opportunities to register um, when your turnover is less than that, um, and particularly important, again, when you've got a, a project looming. The second area I'd like to look at is the distinction between the VAT rates on different types of income and activity that clubs are involved in. And the two principal VAT liabilities are either taxable, where something is liable to VAT or is zero rate, and alternatively, activities which are exempt from VAT. The, import, the distinction between these two categories is very important, not just in terms of declaring VAT and knowing when you need to register for VAT, but also uh, when you come to look at how much VAT can be recovered on costs relating to these activities, uh, particularly, again, important when it's a major capital project. The third area I'd like to look at will be optimizing VAT recovery. How can clubs um, structure themselves and structure their activities so that they can optimize the level of VAT recovery that can be enjoyed on, on costs, uh, both operational costs and capital projects. And then finally, I look at some practical issues that clubs um, are involved in, just drawing on my experiences over the last three or four years of the key issues which uh, clubs need to be advised on and some helpful tips. 
So Mick, could we move on to the next slide, please? Oh, there we go. There we go. So just before we get into the um, the fine detail, just like to put four four statements out there on VAT. One is that VAT recovers VAT recovery requires VAT registration. Um, it, although it's an obvious statement, um, it's not obvious to all. And if a club wishes to recover any VAT from HMRC, then it needs to be registered for VAT purposes, which in itself can be quite daunting for clubs. Uh, but hopefully, as we run through that matter, we will see that it's, uh, it's not that daunting and is an opportunity. The second statement is that VAT recovery is dependent upon use. So really what that is saying is that VAT recovery can be different on different aspects of, of a club, and the level of VAT recovery that can be enjoyed is very finely dependent upon the use of the particular item where a cost is being incurred, be that the pitch, floodlights, 3G artificial pitch, the clubhouse, the car park, whatever. There are lots of different activities, and VAT recovery does not need to be the same across all activities of the club. So again, probably an opportunity more than a problem, as we'll see. The next statement is that VAT recovery position is critical for grant applications. I'm seeing more and more that the, the FA, Football Foundation, Sport England are placing a real onus on the applicant club to establish the best VAT recovery position that, that they can. Uh, these bodies do not like funding VAT, uh, particularly when they see that clubs may be able to take steps themselves so that they can improve um, their own VAT recovery position. Um, we'll look at that in more detail, but it, that's a key point in that irrecoverable VAT can be absolutely critical uh, for whether grant applications are successful or not. Considering they add 20% to the cost of a project, um, these grant bodies do not like funding VAT. The fourth statement before we get into everything is that VAT recovery spreads to the whole club. It's a general misconception that um, if a club registers for VAT, say on a new artificial pitch is installed, that it can ring fence that and merely look at VAT on income and costs relating to that activity. That is not the case. The VAT re registration applies to the whole entity. So if a club registers, it needs to be and take into account all of its incomes and activities, be that the main senior side, the junior section of the club, bar, other activities. Um, and again, we'll, we'll see how that's very important. So Mick, uh, slide change, please. Yeah. So the first particular area I'd like to look at is VAT registration. And there are three different types of VAT registration. There's compulsory registration, which kicks in when taxable income is 85K in any given year. So at the end of each month, if you're getting close to that limit, you're required to look back to the previous 12 and assess whether your income is at 85K. If it is, then you're under a statutory requirement to notify H HMRC and you will be compulsory registered for <coughs> VAT purposes. But again, that's purely taxable income. It's not exempt income. Um, so as we'll see in a minute, this distinction between taxable and exempt income is very important. The second type of VAT registration is voluntary registration. This is where a club's taxable income has not reached 85K in a given year, but there may be a financial benefit to that club actually registering for VAT purposes. That would invariably be where there's an ability to, to recover VAT, probably on a capital project. 
So, again, a very common misconception. Um, I'm told regularly the club cannot register for VAT because its turnover is below this compulsory limit. That is not the case. Any, any club can register for VAT at any time, providing it has one pound's worth of taxable income. Another common misconception is that VAT on the due on income has to exceed the VAT that you want to claim back. That is not the case. Um, I see many um, instances where VAT can be over £100,000 with um, only a very minimal amount of VAT being, being declared against that. Um, there is no correlation between the amount of VAT which you declare and the amount which you can recover. So we've talked about taxable income. We'll look in some detail about the likely sources of taxable income at, at clubs in, in a second. So the, um, the point again down there covers all club activities. If you do register uh, for v VAT, then it's important to remember that it covers all the activities of the club. It may be that the club has a trading company or a separate entity, providing that it is a separate legal entity and not part of that main club, um, then it can be overlooked. But if it's part of the main club, then it all has to be taken into account. Where there are separate legal entities, providing they're corporate bodies um, and one person or um, one club controls all of those bodies, then they can register together as what's called as a group VAT registration. And this is where um, one entity, more than one entity, is under common control. So a very typical scenario would be a club with a trading company. Uh, maybe the trading company looks after the clubhouse or trading and social activities. It can group together with, with the club to lever a better level of VAT recovery. In terms of the application itself, these days it can all be done online. There's also um, a pay, paper format still for making um, ap ap applications. Um, it takes about three to six weeks for that registration to normally come through. So if you are involved in a capital project or facility improvement project, bear in mind that um, don't leave it to the very last minute. Normally worth um, giving at least six weeks advance notice to get your VAT reg registration date through, which on these sort of, sort of projects can be very, VAT can be quite critical for cash flow. So it's important to get your VAT registration in on time. So that's VAT registration. Uh, moving on, Mick. So VAT liability of incomes. You can see on the screen there, there's two distinct categories. Taxable, which for this purpose means liable to VAT, or exempt. So both of these um, types of income are both business transactions where the club is selling something. So it's receiving an income in return for something which it's supplying. But anything which is exempt from VAT, um, it's exempted from the tax. So it's something that would be liable to VAT, but the law specifically exempts that income from VAT. Taxable also includes not just the 20% standard rate VAT, but also the zero rate, which um, can apply to kids' clothing up to the age of 14 or programs, um, certain other things. Okay, so looking at those two categories, um, the first key distinction is that if you're a not-for-profit club, which most clubs at step five, six, and below will be, um, any income to do with playing will invariably be subject will, to, to the exemption. So, for example, player subs, match fees, anything of that sort, signing on fees, joining fees, will all be exempt from VAT. Additionally, things, other things which are exempt from VAT, surprisingly, fixed advertising boards. So boards around the 
perimeter fencing, if they're fixed in a fixed location, um, that is exempt from VAT as HMRC see it as a right over land. Uh, very surprising because most clubs will declare VAT on that and most clubs will take that income into their account when looking at their VAT registration position. Facility letting, um, again, this can get quite complex, uh, but basically the letting of sports facilities is liable to VAT at the standard rate, but if you're letting that facility for 10 sessions or for more than 24 hours, so a weekend, for example, then that income becomes exempt from VAT. That rule is very important when you're looking at uh, artificial pitch installation where the VAT can be substantial um, and the VAT recovery may be dependent on future usage. So if you're letting that facility, you need to be finitely aware of the VAT position of all different lets and incomes. We'll look at that in far more detail a bit, a bit later. The final category on the exempt side there is room hire. So if you have a clubhouse um, or any other facility where you're merely letting space, so a room for a meeting or cubs or um, an AGM or mums and tums, whatever clubs let for, if the bar is not on and there's, or if there's no substantial catering provided, it's room only, room only hire, and that is exempt from VAT. On the other side of the coin is income which is liable to VAT, so it's termed as taxable. So that will include bar and catering income, gate admission income, parking fees, program sales, although they're zero rate, but still taxable, kit sales, merchandise sales, all forms of sponsorship, apart from perimeter board advertising, facility letting, um, so if you're letting sports facilities and it's under 10 sessions or less than 24 hours, then that is subject to VAT. Function hire, so if you let the clubhouse and the bar is on or substantial catering is provided, so you let for a wedding or a wake or birthday party, then that whole hire fee is subject to VAT. And finally on that category is social subscriptions. So as opposed to playing subscriptions, if you're a not-for-profit club, any social subscription or vice president subscription will be liable to VAT. There is a third category of uh, VAT income, which I've not included on that slide um, because it doesn't come into play that much but that is income which is outside the scope of VAT altogether. That will include grants and um, donations. Um, but it's very important when you're receiving um, a donation or sponsorship that it is you make a very clear distinction between sponsorship, where this sponsor will require something back in return. For example, a corporate sponsor will want logo exposure maybe on the kit or in the program or in some on, on the website maybe, as opposed to a donation where there is no requirement for any supply to be made back to the donor. The normal uh, rule that I would apply would be that anything, any monies coming from a corporate or somebody in business would normally be seen as sponsorship and liable to VAT, but anything coming from a private individual would invariably be a d donation. Similarly, if the, if the club is a cask or a charity, a donation you'll get gift aid on. So that distinction is, is very important. The other uh, type of non... Yeah? yeah. Sorry, Russell, we just got a quick question from Joe on this. Yeah. yeah. Hello, Joe, can you... Are you okay? Can you speak now, Joe? We've unmuted you. No, can't get through. Okay, I'll keep trying on the chat. Okay. okay. So we will have a we will have a session at at at, at the end where we can pick up any yeah. questions if, if anything to, doesn't get through. Okay. The other area of non-business income is grants. So if your club is lucky enough to um, receive a grant from the FA, Football Foundation, Sporting, and whoever, um, that grant income is 
outside the scope of VAT because it's merely funding something rather than buying something which the club is supplying back to the grant funder. Mick, can we move on slides? Certainly can. Okay, so we, we've talked about that registration where it's very important to understand the distinction between different club incomes about whether they're taxable or whether they're exempt. And it's only the taxable income which is taken into account when a club is assessing its ability to register for VAT. So that 85K threshold merely um, reflects the taxable income of the club. It does not include the exempt income. And that importance in that distinction carries on when we look at VAT recovery. The basic principle of VAT recovery is that VAT on cost can only be recovered when it relates to what's termed as a taxable income. That is not necessarily the ultimate position, uh, but that is the initial basic position. That which uh, is incurred on cost that relates to an exempt activity or income can only be recovered when it falls below certain de minimis levels, so levels at which HMRC are happy that it's um, so small that it doesn't, doesn't um, impact upon the VAT position of, of, of the organization. We'll look at that in some detail in, in a minute. VAT on cost, which cannot be wholly related to a taxable income or to an exempt income, is then treated as an overhead because it relates partly to taxable activity and partly to exempt income. For example, um, clubhouse cost, where the, where the clubhouse may include both a bar or a refreshment kiosk plus the changing rooms. The changing rooms might be exempt from VAT if they're used by um, players who pay a subscription, for example, all the youth players at a club. But the clubhouse will also be used for the bar, which is generating taxable income through sales of beer and uh, cake catering. So there, anything which is mixed, so any cost which relates to both taxable and exempt income, goes into this partial overhead uh, pot. And we need to assess how much of that is estimated to relate to taxable income and how much is estimated to relate to exempt income. This is normally done using uh, a club's income. So for example, if a club's income is say 60% taxable, then it would be reasonable for that club to wish to, to recover 60% of the VAT it incurs on its overhead costs. This becomes particularly important when you're looking at a major capital uh, project, such as a 3G pitch, where the VAT may be as much as 160, 170,000, and that particular um, activity of, of the pitch may be used for exempt use, which will be club's own use, where the subscribing players are playing or training on it, plus certain hire, which could be exempt from VAT, but there will also be hire, which is liable to VAT at the 20% rate. Therefore, that asset will be used for both taxable and exempt pur purposes, and therefore it will be seen as a partial recovery item. We can just move on to the next slide, Mick. So after the overheads have been apportioned so that part of it is deemed to be taxable and part of it is deemed to be exempt, we can establish the full value of exempt input tax incurred by a club in its that year. And if that VAT on its exempt activities is less than or is no more than these two 
de minimis tests, then it's, the club is allowed to recover that VAT in full. So it, is, it could be that, that a club is able to recover all the VAT it incurs, and that would arise where it's exempt input tax, so that is VAT on purchases that relate to its exempt activities is no more than £7,500 in the year, but also it has to be no more than 50% of the total VAT incurred by that club in that year. That would not be an uncommon position uh, to be in, um, providing the club is generating a, a reasonable level of taxable income, be that from gate admission or clubhouse, kiosk sales, whatever it, whatever it might, might be. So I would say that um, the lower down the step system that, that the club is, the less likely it is to be able to generate sufficient levels of taxable income to be under these partial exemption limits. So it really have to be a club who has either got um, a clubhouse or has a, a gate admission side. Okay, Mick, move on to the next slide, please. So taking that um, concept on further, if the club is involved in um, major expenditure on a particular facility improvement cost, the VAT, as we said earlier, can be quite critical, both to the success of the grant application, but also in terms of uh, mitigating the cost of that improvement work as far as possible. So, as we said earlier, the ability to receive a VAT is largely dependent upon the use to which the facility is put. So, for example, um, pit, pitch work there. So if the pitch, let's say there's some drainage work being carried out at the club, if that is on the main pitch and that's where there's a gate admission to watch the main team play, then it should be wholly possible to agree with HMRC that that VAT is fully recoverable because the pitch is used to attract taxable gate admission. Conversely, if the pitch which is being drained is used by a youth side who pay a, a subscription which is exempt from VAT, so all players within that age group pay a subscription, that pitch um, will predominantly, if, if not wholly, be used for exempt purposes, and therefore there's no automatic right to recover VAT on that, on that cost. It may be that uh, the pitch is also let. If it is, then some of that letting may be taxable, and we're into a partial recovery position. Similarly, the same arguments can be used for floodlights and changing rooms, or anything to do with playing. You need to assess whether that facility is merely used for taxable purposes, in which case the VAT is fully recoverable, or exempt purposes, in which case you're dependent upon the parcel exemption limits. But in most situations, it will be wholly possible to um, consider that that activity is used for both taxable and exempt activities. And it may be that you can enable that, that position. Um, for example, it's quite common for clubs who are having major works done on training facilities to make sure that they're let at certain times where that is charged, be that to a local club or a school or an academy, to ensure that that facility is not used for its own exempt purposes, but also is used for an external letting income, so we can say it's genuinely used for both taxable and exempt purposes. Moving down there to youth facilities, these are particularly problematic in that um, most clubs' structure will be that 
all the age group teams coming up through the youth section will play an, an exempt subscription to the club. So exempt income will be generated through subscriptions and match fee, um, which means that any cost which directly relates to those those teams will invariably be seen as exempt input tax. So again, uh, we're dependent upon getting that VAT under the £7,500 limit per annum in order to, to re re recover it. Conversely, moving down the gated mission ground, say any VAT incurred on anything to do with the ground or pitch where there's a gate admission for spectators, um, including training areas for, for teams where there's a gate admission to their main games, they should be, the VAT on any cost relating to that should be fully re recoverable on the grounds that it's attributable to a taxable income. Moving down, three key pitches. Um, Recovering VAT on artificial pitches um, is relatively straightforward because invariably uh, the pitches have to be let extensively throughout the week in order to make them commercially viable. This being so, the club's own use may be relatively m minimal. It may just need it between six and nine each, each n n night of the week. Therefore, letting the pitch um, throughout throughout the day or certain other times. If that external letting can be structured in such a way that it's liable to VAT, and that is a relatively straightforward process, that will increase the ability of the club to recover that on artificial pitch installation. Um, we'll see a bit later there is what's called an option to tax which can be strategically used to convert certain exempt incomes into vatable incomes, and that's very useful on an artificial pitch uh, cost. Clubhouses and car parks, um, you would expect VAT on expenses relating to the clubhouse and car park to be fully recoverable. Not always the case, I'm afraid. Um, a car park, for example, may serve not just the clubhouse but also the general grounds where the youth teams train again because the youth teams generate exempt subscription income VAT recovery can become more difficult uh, but also if, depending on the use of the clubhouse there may be external letting where it's room only hire and if that room only hire is exempt from VAT then we're jeopardising a full VAT recovery on any related clubhouse cost. So it's important if you've got clubhouse expenditure coming up to uh, ensure that the clubhouse is solely used for taxable purposes, which effectively means that all external letting is liable to VAT, and that can be achieved through opting to tax the clubhouse. We'll look at that in, in a sec. The final um, issue on that, that recovery for major improvements is where there's a local authority landlord. Um, local authorities, such as county councils, town councils, parish councils, all have very preferential VAT re recovery rules. So where there's a major faci facility improvement, which is being grant funded, it's uh, invariably possible to have the local authority landlord as a joint applicant on the grant application and that can enable VAT to be recovered in full and then the facility let to the club under peppercorn or another le lease arrangement. So if, if you are considering a major um, cost on anything to do with your grounds or pitches or installation of an artificial pitch and your grounds are let from a local authority, this may be a very beneficial route to um, consider so that, as you may save a lot of VAT, or your grant funder may save a lot of VAT, which would make your application that more attractive. 
Okay. Um, next slide, Mick. So we've got mixed use facilities. So this is just drawing on the key points of where um, a facility within the club is used for both taxable and exempt purposes. So a very good example of that would be an artificial pitch. So effectively the VAT recovery is um, relates to the extent to which that facility is used for taxable purposes. So on an artificial pitch installation, you're able to agree with HMRC that you can use a projection of the usage. So if your grant application, which they do, require you to project the use of that facility for the next th three to five years, you can say to HMRC, our projection anticipates um, external letting of the pitch for, say, 75 percent of the time it's available for use, we're going to charge VAT on all our external letting, and therefore you can agree a 75% VAT recovery on the installation. However, that's all dependent upon establishing the, the right VAT position on external letting of sports facilities. In general, the rule is that if you're letting sports facilities, the charge is taxable, so it's subject to VAT at 20%. However, if that um, rental charge relates either to 10 sessions or more, so if you're letting to a club for its winter training and the um, charge relates to 10 sessions or more, then the VAT liability of your rental income converts from being taxable to being exempt. Similarly, if you let the facility for a continuous period of more than 24 hours, so for example for a weekend, then that again becomes exempt from the VAT. We'll just jump down one bullet point to the option to tax because the option to tax is um, a mechanism whereby a club can elect to waive the exemption over its grounds. Once you've done that, all letting of sports facilities becomes liable to VAT, even if they're let for 10 sessions or more or for a period exceeding 24 hours. This can obviously be a very useful tactic when you're incurring that on the cost of the installation or ongoing maintenance, you want the taxable use of that facility to be as high as possible. There's only one potential um, exception to that rule, and that is where you let facilities directly to individuals. If you're a not-for-profit club, the letting of sports facilities directly to an individual for their own use is exempt from VAT, and there's no way around that, I'm afraid. So if in your grant application you're required to make your facility available for pay and play sessions or community use, then um, I'm afraid an option to tax isn't going to completely get rid of exempt activity on it. That's quite a complicated area, uh, and there's some uncertainty with HMRC as to how far that, that exemption applies. Um, but it's accepted, I think, that it's merely to individuals or groups of individuals. Therefore, any club letting um, would not qualify for that. So you can charge that on to other clubs, to schools, and any, any other group user. Projected usage, uh, we said earlier that if you are installing a major facility, you're allowed to agree with HMRC that you can base your VAT recovery, perhaps not on initial or historic use, but you can base it on projected usage of when that facility is fully up and running, which can be very advantageous when you're considering letting facilities externally or if you're 
building clubhouse or catering facilities or something of that sort, where it may take a year or two for the full taxable use of those facilities to, to come through. Finally, on VAT recovery, um, there's a special arrangement, very special arrangement, called the Capital Goods Scheme. This kicks in if you're involved in any facility improvement where the cost net of that is over 250k. Where this applies, you're required to monitor the use of that asset for a period of 10 years to gauge any difference between the relationship between exempt and taxable activity. It's a bit of a red herring because um, any difference is only adjusted annually and it's only adjusted at 10% of the difference. So they really are minimal adjustments. Therefore, it's the initial rate of recovery which is all important particularly for cash flow when uh, you're going through the building process. So that's VAT recovery, a bit of a minefield. Mick, can we go on to the, the next slide? Just in summary, VAT registration, it's not just possible if your taxable income is over 85K per annum. You can voluntarily register for that but there's likely to be a correlation between the level of your taxable income and the level of VAT recovery, which you can enjoy. So before um, you jumped into voluntary registration, you would be wise to make a very good assessment of what the benefit w will be of doing that, because the only, the only advantage of voluntary VAT registration will be a financial be benefit in terms of recovering VAT. If you do register for VAT for the first time, uh, you're able to potentially recover VAT on assets which you still hold and which were bought in the last four years immediately prior to the date of registration. And a lot of clubs um, have been successful in, in doing that and receiving quite substantial windfalls as a result. Particularly relevant if you have built anything uh, which costs more than 250k in the last 10 years because under the capital goods scheme if those assets are used wholly or partly for taxable purposes you've got a 10 year window to seek some VAT recovery on that so even though you built it it was grant funded potentially and it was built 10 years ago there's still a current ability to recover some VAT on that project now if you register for VAT. Um, I've just done that with a club where they built new changing rooms about seven years ago and we were able to recover £35,000 um, out of a total VAT bill of something like 120000 spread and the recovery of that 35000 is spread over the next three years. Uh, but it was a complete windfall for the club, which they were not expecting. The second issue in summary is uh, VAT returns and records. A lot of people have put off VAT registration because they believe the uh, administration and record keeping will be too onerous. Um, I'd suggest that's probably not the case. It's merely um, tapping into your what you should currently be, be, be doing as, as a club, VAT registration and VAT records can prove a very useful ma management term in, in terms that it makes you record your income and, and your costs on a regular basis, and it's not left until the end of each season or the end of a six-month six period. Um, but once, once you're using either software to keep, keep your accounting records, which most clubs probably are now, then it's a very straightforward process of adapting that to enable you to complete the VAT return. Next bullet point, grant applications. As we said earlier, um, more and more I'm finding that the Football Foundation, the FA and other sports governing bodies are putting a real onus on clubs to establish um, beyond doubt 
their VAT recovery position at the time of the grant ap application. Um, it used to be assumed if somebody was VAT registered that they would get all their VAT back. That's clearly not the case, um, and clubs would be well advised as part of that grant application process to seek professional help, as it, I think you'll find it will save a lot of money. Um, and it's now becoming a prerequisite of making certainly major grant applications uh, that clubs establish their VAT position beyond any doubt. Moving on, next bullet point. Um, when clubs are involved in capital projects, uh, things like invoice timing and VAT return timing can be absolutely critical to cash flow. Um, the, one of the problems with VAT is that even though you may be able to recover it, you invariably will have to have paid it out first to your supplier. So if you're building a new clubhouse or changing rooms or installing a 3G pitch, the VAT on these costs will be substantial. And it may be, if you get the timing wrong, that you may not be able to recover VAT up to four months after you've paid it to your supplier. So giving some thought to the timing of invoicing uh, and the timing of returns, you're able to go on to monthly returns if, if you want to throughout the build period. Uh, these things can be quite critical to, to the success of projects. Uh, the final point I'd like to look at is um, whether it's possible for clubs to avoid VAT on construction of clubhouses and changing room blocks. Um, this is done through the zero rating of the construction. It's only available to charities, registered charities, so not CASCs, um, and it's very specific for two different uses. One is for non-business use. That's a bit of a red herring because any club who charges a subscription to its players is in business for, for that purposes, so that relief will not apply. But if you're building a major uh, clubhouse or major changing rooms, it may be worthwhile considering waiving this subscription for a period of time so that you actually qualify for non-business use. The other relief is for use as a village hall or similarly in providing social or recreational facilities to a local community. A lot of clubs try to avoid paying VAT using this relief, but there's been a VAT tribunal case, um, one of many, uh, which was heard in December of last year involving Green Island Club in Northern Ireland which effectively um, has prevented any clubs receiving the benefit of that relief unless the um, building which is being built is genuinely a village hall and is used by a broad range of community groups within the local c community, but is also managed and run by a broad group. Therefore, the football club would lose control, and that makes it very un unattractive. I would certainly not proceed um, with trying to get zero rating on any construction without taking professional advice in advance, because the penalties for issuing a uh, incorrect declaration to get zero rating are extremely harsh, uh, and I've seen a lot of clubs incur them. Um, when they would have been well advised to take professional advice in advance. One issue which might be um, important, the Green Island VAT Tribunal did throw up an, an important point. If any club has issued a zero rate certificate for the construction of a new building and they took professional advice, but the advice they received was incorrect, then uh, they can avoid any penalty which has been issued by H HMRC on the grounds that they have a reasonable excuse. So if any club has incurred a civil penalty for issuing an incorrect zero rating certificate to avoid that on the construction of a building and they sought professional advice, then they can um, 
go back to HMRC and should have that penalty overturned. Bearing in mind the penalty is 100% of the VAT that's been avoided, that would be well worthwhile. So I think that that's more than enough, Mick. And that's come to an end. Hello? Thank you very much indeed, Russell. There, there's been quite a few people, a couple have had to leave um, and want the slide send it on, so they've sent me their email address, so I will send that through, which is great. Um, does anybody have any questions? If you, if you want to ask Russell a question, by all means, just drop me a chat, just say yes, and I'll unmute you. And we can then ask, oh, David, yeah, raising your hand, excellent. So David, found out how to raise a hand, that's brilliant. Hello. Hello, David. Yeah, can you hear me? Hello, David. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I was under the impression that um, any new build, i.e. from a Greenfield site, the materials would be back exempt like on a house. Is that true? No, not at all. Um, if you are, if your club is a registered charity, then there is a very slim possibility that you might be able to avoid that on the build cost. But if you're not a registered charity, then there is no possibility of avoiding the VAT at all. On the materials only, you can't get VAT back from that at all. Did you hear that, Russell? Sorry, was that on the materials only? Yes. Yeah. No, there's no no relief at all. Right, okay. Because I, I thought that if you do a, like a house extension, you have to pay the VAT on the material. But if you knock the house down completely and start again, there's no VAT on the material. No, that's correct. But that's a domestic residential dwelling, which right. is fundamentally different than, unfortunately, than a sports facility. Okay, got that. Okay, thank you. All right, excellent. Thank you very much, David. David, before you go, how did you raise your hand? Uh, I, um, good question. Uh, <laughs> there, there's some icons at the bottom. Yeah. I think I use one of them, but I'm not sure how it happened. <laughs> Excellent. Well, hopefully, uh, I can't see any more raised hands and there's no more people. There's been people on the chat as we've been going through. So, uh, there, I can't see that there's any more hands or any more chats coming through. Oh, Alan, just raise your hand. Excellent. So, Alan, there you go. The floor is yours. Which is from fundraising, so from raffles, race nights, things like that. Is that taxable income or non-taxable? Uh, the vast majority of that will be either um, donations from individuals, uh, so if somebody's doing a sponsored event, then that would be that free. But yeah. if the club is undertaking an event and the principal purpose of that event is to raise funds for the club and or a charity, then that income can be exempt from VAT. Importantly, yeah. that would also include any bar and catering on the evening. So if those items are sold by the same entity running the fundraising event, so, for example, if you had a race night in your clubhouse, yeah. then all income from that event would be exempt from VAT. Right. Even the so we'd have to sort of uh, because if if the bar then was serving the lounge and the bar, we'd have to try and work out how much money was from the yeah. bar and how much. You'd have to room. distinguish between the two, unless the right. whole thing was was the fundraising event. Yeah. It's, Okay, thanks very much. Okay. Okay, there's been a few people requesting, so Paul and John requesting the the slides. Uh, I, yeah, I'll send those through to you together with a, a link of the recording. Okay, so people on the chat who've been putting down, can you send me uh, copies of the, the slides? I'll do that. I'm also quite aware that Matt Aitkins contacted a few league secretaries at Step 5 and 6 clubs and let them know about 
the the WebEx. What I will do is I will also send that through Matt, so Matt can then send it through to the clubs, uh, the league secretaries as well, who can then forward them on. Okay. Um, Pete. Uh, Pete, Pete. Um, okay, don't know. Pete. I think, Pete, you just started to animate uh, or want requesting animation, but I don't think that's uh, what you were really trying. Okay. Let me just try and find you, Pete, so I can then unmute you in case you've got something there. There's no chat from you, Pete. Um, we can't hear. So what we'll do is we'll finish there. Can I just say thank you very much for all of you enter, coming on this evening. It's been really, really appreciative. I've learned so much, Russell. Um, there's lots of things in there that I, t I didn't have a clue about um, within there. And as you can see, you've, you've had some real success with lots of clubs. Um, so just finally from us is these are Russell's contact details. Um, as a result, as one of our, our pilot clubs and for these clubs who've actually entered onto this, if you actually want to go into more detail with Russell around this, by all means, could you just sort of like give him a call? And, you know, we're happy to try and support you through this as well. So there's an opportunity, obviously, if you do have questions, and I appreciate everything's very individualistic around uh, the tax and whether or not you've got some elements that are um, partially exempt or fully exempt. So please do contact Russell. Russell will obviously get in contact with myself about um, you know, ensuring that he can support clubs such as yourselves. But thank you very much for attending. Hopefully you found it really useful. Um, I've had a lot of chats on there with people really, really sort of like happy with the content and really interesting. And so thank you again. Um, we will send the, the link around and have a good evening. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very, thank much. You very much, Russell. Bye. Greatly appreciate it. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to the FA Football Forum. If you like this episode and you want any more information, please visit thefa.com forward slash clubs and leagues or email clubsprogram at thefa.com. If you want a monthly dose of this content, be sure to search the Grassroots Football Hub on YouTube or find In The Box on your favourite podcast provider. This is the podcast supporting grassroots clubs and leagues be the best places to play and enjoy the game.